So welcome back um, to the third hour uh, for today. And um, that essentially is the state uh, the, where we stopped before the break. Um, so we have come up with an ordinary differential equation with non-constant coefficients, um, which describe my uh, azimuthal velocity as a function of r. Now, also here, uh, you can go back to your um, algebra classes or analysis classes. And um, what you will see from there is that, okay, I need to change the color. So what you will see is that there is actually a solution to this problem. So u theta of r can be written as a superposition of um, three different uh, parts, a divided by r plus b times r plus c times r times ln of r. So you can fill that in and you will see that that, that all is um, going to be zero. And um, also the fact that you have three different terms is not um, perhaps not surprising because we have a third order differential equation. So that means we need to have thir three, um, that we need to have three um, integration constants to look at. Now, so in principle, the, the problem now has reduced to being able to solve this equation uh, or to solve to, to, to identify the um, A's, the B's and the C's. There's one, one thing here, which I will also not like not go into the details, but it's not so difficult to, to understand that. But uh, essentially to avoid issues with the pressure, with the pressure at R being zero, um, we actually set C to be uh, zero. So we essentially remove the C part here. Um, and that has, as I said, has to do with like being able to calculate the pressure in the in the center. Of course, it's interesting to, to realize that that we keep the, the first part in there. And of course, if R goes to zero, the first part uh, tends to go to infinity. Um, but uh, but that's not so much of a of a of a big problem. As, as it is for this for the second term. Okay, so that means that with this we actually get a general solution u theta as a function of r is a divided by r plus b times r. So any solution that we get for concentric circular streamlines is of the form a divided by r plus b times r. So we have a one over r term and we have a, a term linear with r. Now we can actually calculate the pressure that, that I just mentioned before. Um, if we use the, the momentum equations um, in the radial direction, So the radial momentum equations, um, they reduce actually to, to dp dr being the same as rho times u theta uh, squared divided by, by r. So that's the, the radial momentum equation, the only ones that actually are, are interesting here. And, and of course, if you look at this, in particular, if you look at this term, so you have a u theta squared divided by r. If you now think back at your mechanics mechanics um, lectures, uh, this here is actually a sentry petal um, acceleration. So that's um, uh, that's the. Um, kind of the, the the reason why why you actually make a, a circular streamlines you have the pressure force to act as a centripetal force to keep the the velocities uh, in a circular form or let's put it like this it's more like a chicken and egg problem the streamlines are circular because of the pressure and the pressure is such that we get uh, circular streamlines but in the end this is the force balance that we will get here, we have a centri centrifugal force, which is counted, counteracted by the centripetal force of the, of the pressure, which keeps the, 
the, the fluid particles, um, the fluid particles on track on the circular line. So, I mean, again, thinking a little bit of, of mechanics one. So the, 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 the velocity u theta, uh, or the, the, actually we could write it like this. So the, the u velocity vector, which actually is u theta, is constant. So it has the constants has a constant speed, but the direction uh, the direction uh, changes on this circular path. And that's exactly why we need to have this um, centripetal acceleration to make it stay on the on the circle. Okay, so now we have calculated the pressure. Um, we can now also calculate the vorticity. Well, what, what do I mean with that? Well, we have now this expression for the velocity and we have had higher up. Yes, here we had the expression for the vorticity. So, so this, this one here, the expression for the vorticity, which uh, there is only one component left, um, which is this um, the set component of the vorticity. Which of course also makes sense that it's only the set component because that's kind of the how how the flow is rotating as as we have seen in 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 this case here in this sketch here. So we can calculate now this um, this component omega in the set direction, which is according to the uh, the above uh, equation, it's one over r of d r u theta divided by d, uh, not by d r, by d, um, uh, divided by d r. The other term was, uh, was zero. And of course, now feeding in um, the expression that we have, uh, we actually get one over r d d r of a plus b r squared. Um, yeah, so this is the this is the vorticity. So we have an expression for the velocity up here, and we have an expression for the vorticity in this um, in this case as a function of a and b. And a and b these are two integration constants which we can calculate. Um, you know, for, for whatever whatever is needed for, for solving our, our problem of these concentric streamlines. Um, we can also study now uh, the arising flow or the, the, the velocity profiles depending on, you know, the values of this A and B, because it turns out that this A and B somehow uh, are quite um, quite important uh, in characterizing the velocity profile because in one case it will be linear, and in the other case it will be inversely linear. So they somehow they may have a meaning of what what it actually what it means to the flow. And what one typically says here is that we distinguish we we distinguish two cases. We have case one, and we have case two. Case one is when we set B to zero, and case two would be if we set A to zero. And you will very soon see why we, we have this, this, this distinction. So for B being zero, well, the, the velocity profile would be, um, it would be like this, U of theta is, well, if B is zero, it would just be A divided by R. The vorticity, in this case, um, if B is zero, would be, well, one over R D D R of R times A divided by R. R divided by R obviously is, is one, and then we have A, which is a constant, D D R of A is zero. Well, 
vorticity is zero for case one. So that means for if I set B to zero, then I have a flow without any vorticity. Okay, for, for the time being, this is fine. Um, vorticity is zero. Case two, I set A to zero. That means that my velocity profile, U theta, um, is now just uh, B times R. So linearly increasing. And the vorticity omega z, again, if I just uh, write it out, it would be one over r d d r of b r squared. Um, well, r squared would be uh, the derivative of d d r of b r squared would be two b r divided by r. Well, what is left is 2b. So I have a vorticity in case A, in case two, which is constant, constant 2b. So these are these are the two cases. I have different velocity profiles and I have very different, um, very different uh, values for the for the vorticity. Before we analyze that a little bit in more detail, I would just like to do one comment. So we should actually remember uh, for, for this whole der derivation that, right, that the viscous contribution, so the viscous forces um, in this case, they were as follows. They were nu times nabla, nabla squared um, of u, or as we as we have seen last time, new times um, nabla cross omega, and they were actually zero for both cases, or they are zero for 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 both cases, um, because uh, as you, as you can well as as you can see that the the curl of the vorticity, as you as you as you can see here, the curl of the vorticity is zero. So the, the viscosity for those cases. So that means that these two solutions, so case one and case B, are actually inviscid solutions. In the sense that they could have been also obtained, could be obtained, um, via the Euler equations. So that means that the viscosity actually does not play a role here. The, the two cases that I have, case one and case B, they do not depend on the, let's say the amplitude of the viscosity. The viscosity doesn't go in here. So it's, it's, it doesn't matter whether we started from, a, uh, from, from the Euler equations or the Navier-Stokes equations. Both of these solutions are equally valid um, in, 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 in both uh, situations. Okay, now let's try to sketch these two cases. So we have case one and case two, one where we have a linear velocity profile and one when, where we have an inversely linear velocity profile. So let's do like this. We have case one here, and we have case two here. And uh, let's let's just kind of define the center for both of these cases. And um, of course, the, the kind of the idea is that the flow would would kind of go around like this. It's concentric streamlined, so there would be kind of a, a ray of or a whole family of these concentric lines uh, to be visible. But the velocity profile, so u theta as a function of r would now look very different. So again, I can put that in, in both cases. So we have r, we have u theta. Now for case a, uh, for case one, we said it's a, uh, the, the behavior is one over r. So that means the velocity would actually look something like this. This would be a one over r be, uh, behavior and the velocity vectors 
the velocity vectors would be something like this. So it will decay to, to zero further away from the center. And this was the case where the vorticity um, was zero. So I can just write it down. Omega z was zero in this case. Case two was uh, was different. There we had the, 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 the velocity, the u theta velocity actually increasing linearly as a function of the radial distance. So this was, this was proportional to one over r. This is proportional to r. And here the vorticity omega z um, was uh, constant to b. Not nicely written. So constant to b. Okay. So, so that means let's assume I have a fluid particle that is located here. That fluid particle that kind of rotates around you know, travels in a, on this uh, cir concentric circular streamline. Of course, I, I can do the same also in this case. I have one like this. Okay. Now, I have one question here. Let's assume that this fluid particle is not just a round particle, but it's it's a particle that kind of looks like an like an arrowhead. So there will be kind of a, a it has a you know it points in a, in a certain direction. Also here, this one here. It points in a certain direction. In these two cases, when this part this this arrowhead is now rotating um, in in uh, for this uh, case A uh, for case one and case B. What happens to the direction of this arrowhead? In what direction does this arrowhead rotate as we move around this, um, around these concentric circles? And I've prepared a poll with that. So how do these particles rotate for these two cases? With rotate, I mean, how does the, you know, it, it points upwards. How does it change its direction as it rotates? Does it, does the, 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 the tip rotate in the, for the two cases in the same direction? Or does it in one case rotate to the left and the other case to the right? Or does it only rotate for the first case, so case number one? Or does the arrowhead rotate for case um, B, uh, case two? Okay. So I see that there's a lot of um, answers that suggest that it's mainly case two um, where, where the whole thing is rotating. Why is this the case? Can anybody say why? So why is it only rotating for case two? Because in the first one, there is no vorticity. Exactly. Okay, I, I see it's, it was a too easy question, but it's actually a very important, it's a very important realization. Uh, we have already written it, here, the vorticity is zero. So that means for a low, it's everywhere zero. For a local fluid element, the fluid particle, it will not experience any rotation. So that means for the first case, if we're up here, the, the arrow would still look upwards. Oh yeah. If we, if we are here, well, same way, the arrow would still look upwards if we're here. It will still look upwards. In the second case, well, it is like this that it will actually rotate, and um, it's also now quite easy to, or quite easy. I mean, it's 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 
somewhat obvious to see why this is the case, because the velocity actually increases as you go further away. So that means that on this side, you will rotate a little bit faster than here. So that means at this position, you have exactly rotated by 90 degrees. Here you would look, you would look down and here you would look to the right. So like this. I mean, as I said, it's, it's maybe obvious or maybe very easy to, uh, to understand that, but of course it's a very important concept because it essentially tells you that you have two different types of solution. One solution where a fluid particle is not rotating and a second one where it is rotating. So this is really a, a fundamental difference between a case one and case two. And of course there's names for that. This one here is called an irrotational vortex. Um, irrotational, of course, comes from the fact that omega z is zero, so there is no rotation in it. So it's an irrotational flow with um, no vorticity, or the vort vorticity being zero. That's the definition of irrotation. Whereas for case two, we rotate, and actually we rotate in the case or in, in, in a way that would resemble a solid body rotation. So you can assume or you can view this as being the kind of a, 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 this arrowhead being, being on top of a solid body and we just rotate the solid body. And of course that's exactly this, the linearly increasing velocity profile which gives you this solid body rotation. A solid body rotation has vorticity. Vorticity is not equals uh, equaling zero. Okay, now there's actually uh, one important, uh, one important um, uh, aspect that I would like to, um, uh, to mention here. If we, have an irrotational flow or an irrotational um, vortex um, like, like here, that implies that this is an, this may be, or, or this is an inviscid solution. As we have just seen before, because the vorticity actually is never, um, never present here. But, we can also directly see that if you are in visit, this does not imply that it's irrotational. No. Okay. Because if it's inviscid, it can also uh, go into the solid body rotation state as we have um, just seen. So that means that the, the two um, expressions or the two words irrotational, meaning that there's no vorticity and inviscid, meaning that there, is, that there may be no viscosity are not the same. Irrotational implies that it, that it is an inviscid solution Inviscid, however, does not mean that the flow is irrotational. You can get an inviscid solution, which is not rotation, which is rotation. So the important conclusion from all of this, uh, for this whole chapter, when we calculated this, um, uh, when we started here with concentric uh, circular streamlines, the whole point of this was to realize that in those situations, we actually get a velocity profile that looks like this, I make it also yellow, maybe to make it stand out a little bit more. So we get a velocity profile that looks like this. It's A divided by R plus B times R. And all these concentric streamlines can be written in this way. And if we just look at a vortex, then we have these two kind of main, main proponents, one where we have A being zero and the other one where we have B being zero. We have an irrotational vortex or a solid body um, rotation. Now, uh, to continue from here, 
we actually would like to use this to to um, to understand uh, or to, to to use it in in actual calculations to maybe understand a little bit better how these flow or how flow cases may look like where we have um, concentric streamlines. And there's um, mainly two examples that I would like to show you where, um, where this is relevant. There's of course many more, um, but uh, for, for this course, um, we, we, can, we can look at two examples. So examples with concentric streamlines. The first example I would like to show you is a flow case that we have already halfway uh, introduced earlier. Um, that is Taylor Coet flow. Um, Taylor, Taylor Coet flow looks like this. We have one cylinder, and then we have a second cylinder. And this should be a bit nicer. So these are two cylinders that should be concentric. So there is um, there is kind of a, um, an axis for these uh, these two cylinders. And now it turns out that these two cylinders. Um, so the first one, of course, continues here inside. So something like that. Um, and it turns out that these two cylinders they actually rotate. So we can say maybe that the the inner cylinder has a rotational speed of omega, capital omega zero, and the outer one has a rotation speed of omega one. You can of course define also a radius R zero and R one of these, these two cylinders. And um, obviously this is a case where I wanna have a, um, a cylindrical coordinate system. So that means that this direction I would I would call my set direction, and then in plane, I would have my my radial and azimuthal directions. So what what a, a good question here to ask is, what is the velocity profile that I get? You know, kind of velocity profile that I would have here. So what? How does the flow look like between if you if we rotate these cylinders with various speeds? <clears throat> How would the velocity profile look like? Well, so if you now if you now start to analyze that, so first of all, I mean this is concentric cylinders. Cylinders. So that means that that there is actually no reason why my solution should not be concentric streamlined. I mean, from all the symmetries of the problem that we have, there is no reason why they why it should not be like that. So concentric streamlines. So that means my velocity u theta as a function of r, or the solution is u theta as a function of r. This 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 blue this blue solution that I have u theta as a function of r. And of course that means now um, that that I know how this looks like. This u theta as a function of r is a solution to, or is composed of a divided by r plus b times r, because that's um, that's what I what I derived here. That's the that's the only solution that I can have when I have concentric flows. Well, and I guess now you already know how to how to do this, how to how to solve this problem. Well. We need to determine A and B via um, the boundary conditions. Boundary conditions. Well, and in this case, um, uh, this would be no slip. Um, so U theta equals. Uh, R times omega, uh, so no slip um, conditions. 
at both um, surfaces, so at R0 and R1. So the first condition, the, one, the first one would be U theta at R being R0 would be um, omega zero times R0. And the second condition U theta R being R1 would be omega one R R1. And of course, now you also see why why it was important to get rid of this uh, logarithmic logarithmic term in this in this expansion for the velocity, because we would essentially not not be able to specify one more condition, except for claim or for asking for the regularity of the pressure. But it's these two these two conditions that I that I have, and um, well. Of course, now I can I can set up the uh, the, the system essentially in the, in the way um, that I'm saying that well for the for the first case I will have omega zero times r zero is the same as a divided by r zero plus b times r zero and the second one here I would say that omega one r one is a divided by R1 plus B divided by uh, B, B times R1. And now, of course, you can solve this and, um, and one, one calculate, um, one can do that. Again, this is not something that I think is particularly interesting um, uh, to, do, uh, to do together, but the result will now be an expression for A. That's maybe more interesting to just write that down. So for A, we will get something like R0 squared times R1 squared times omega zero minus um, omega one. And this is divided by R1 squared minus R0 squared. And correspondingly, the B term here to again be in the same uh, denominator. And in the numerator, we have omega one R one squared minus omega zero R zero squared. So, and of course, this we will then fit in. I mean, the the the, the, the values for for a and b values for a and b would then go into to this expression for for the u theta velocity, and I can directly then write down what the, what the laminar velocity between these two concentric cylinders is. Then, of course, this is a nice result. I mean, I guess uh, two hours ago, you would not have had a lot of ideas of how to, how to calculate that. Now we know that we, we, we have one family of solutions with A and B, and all these concentric flows need to, need to look like. And again, to, to remind you that this is actually a relevant case because um, you, could, you can essentially use this to, to estimate viscosities, to estimate the forces that you get from the gradients at the wall. Um, and you can, you can, I mean, it's a relevant case when it's, about, um, when it's about lubrication, when you have an axle inside a, a housing. Uh, so it's a, it's a relevant uh, flow case to, uh, to consider. Maybe just uh, one interesting aspect here is um, when do you get, or on, under what circumstances do you get uh, A and B to be zero? Well, I guess one interesting case is if the, if the two cylinders, they rotate um, with the same angular velocity, well, so same angular velocity. Well, that means that, um, so if omega zero is equal to omega one, then of course it means that in the expression for A, the numerator becomes zero. So that means that A is zero. And A being zero, um, that means, if now go and check here, that would be uh, corresponding to case uh, case two. And of course, this in the end would mean that you have a solid body rotation. You just have, you know, everything rotates with the same angular velocity. 
So you will have the whole, the whole package kind of rotating at the same speed. The mean velocity profile um, in, inside or between these two rotating cylinders would just be kind of linear, uh, a linear line well, according, to, according to this one. So in that sense, this, uh, this all makes, uh, makes sense. This would be solid body rotation. Okay. <clears throat> so now, so I guess this this all makes um, makes sense, and um, and we can we can kind of believe that this this solution is the correct solution for uh, for Taylor Coet flow. Um, before we close this um, this first example and go to the second example, I would just like to briefly mention um, an alternative way to, to or an, uh, an alternative view um, to look at this. I don't think we will manage to finish it um, all today, but I can I can kind of start with um, with prevent or presenting you the idea, and then next time we can we can conclude that. So, alternative way um, to to calculate A and B. Or to to understand to uh, to calculate a and b via the vorticity directly because now we uh, here we just use the velocity profile and we put the boundary conditions on the velocity which of course is valid but we can actually do it also via the vorticity or at least we can use the vorticity to make a plausibility check to make sure that everything is um, is, is correct okay well so if you do that via the vorticity. So first we need to understand or well understand, we should uh, remember which vorticity component is actually present in this case. First for this, we can go up again. Here we have the vorticity. It's only omega z with this particular formula, one over RT, DDR of A plus BR. So, <clears throat> Remember that we only um, that we only have um, the omega set components of the vorticity in the along the, the the axis, and this is because because we have a planar motion. So every the the whole motion is in one plane. So that means the vorticity uh, sticks out. So the vorticity. So there's two consequences of that. So the vorticity is a scalar. So not a vector anymore, or I mean, well, it's a, it's a vector with, with with just one direction. So it's uh, defined um, um, with with a scalar value. And also, as we have said in the beginning, there is actually no vortex stretching or vortex tilting. This we said in the beginning that this additional term, the vortex stretching and and the vortex tilting term is only there if you have three-dimensional flows, uh, but not for two-dimensional flows. So that means in the end that the vorticity transport equation is just, uh, it's essentially an advection diffusion equation where, where you have the, the, the material derivative and um, a diffusive term, but you don't have this, this um, uh, source or sink term uh, corresponding to vortex stretching. So the equation for the for the vorticity is actually much simpler. So that means now, if we if we accept that the, uh, that this is what happens, it means that the vorticity in this uh, case, the, 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 the omega z vorticity is generated at the walls, as we have seen um, that, that we have seen for the um, for the case with um, uh, with the channel flow before. So the vorticity is generated at the wall, and is then injecting this vorticity, injecting into the domain. So essentially diffusing. Well, it starts at the wall. It's injecting into the domain, and from there 
the vorticity is then diffusing into the domain or throughout the domain, perhaps we could, we could say. So from a vorticity point of view, what happens is that we generate the vorticity at the walls because that's the only place where we can generate it. And then we have the diffusive action that, that transports the vorticity into, um, into the domain. Okay, sorry. Um, good. Once we have understood uh, this, this basic idea, we actually need to introduce another concept, which I guess you have already done with, with Alessandro, um, and that is the concept of the circulation. The circulation being the line integral of the velocity along a, um, along a, a closed, well, a, a closed path. This is what is called the circulation. And what you know from there is that the difference in circulation, in circulation, circulation, this corresponds to the vorticity times the area between, between the, 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 the two line integrals where you calculate the, the, the difference of the, of the vorticity about. Now, what does this have to do with this Taylor Coet flow? Well, let's let's do kind of the sketch again of the Taylor Coet flow. We have here the outer cylinder, and then we have the inner cylinder, something like that. Now, we have here a region. So essentially, the cross section where we have vorticity. In here, um, we, we have, um, well, we have vorticity, omega, omega z. But what we can do now is we can define two surfaces or two closed line lines, one right out here at the outer cylinder and the other one around the inner cylinder. And of course, using the notation as before, that the inner cylinder has value zero and the outer one has value one, we can say that this one here would be the circulation one. The, the Greek letter uh, for circulation would be a, a big gamma. Um, so this is uh, this is um, one, and this one would be uh, gamma zero. Okay, how big are now these two circulations. Well, if we start with um, circulation gamma zero, well, as I just said, this is just uh, the velocity integrated along a path line. So that is the circumference times the velocity. So this would be two pi times r zero times omega zero r zero. That's the cir circulation of the of uh, of zero which means then it's two pi, <clears throat> two pi r zero squared omega zero. So this would be now the circulation along the, the, the inner dashed line. And of course, it's the same for, for one, which we have the same result, two pi times r one squared times omega one. Okay, how is this important now? Well, <laughs> Now we, we have this green area here and, and this green area is bounded by circulation gamma one and circulation gamma two. Now we know actually that gamma one minus gamma two would be the area of the green stuff times the vorticity. I mean, technically it needs to be, I mean, you, you would, I mean, in principle, it should actually be the, the area integral of the vorticity dA. But, um, but in our case, if we, if we now go and, and look, um, um, if we now go and, go and look that 
um, this is actually depending on, on A and B, uh, this would actually become a, a constant here. So that means it's um, that the integral is just the vorticity times the uh, the vorticity times uh, the area. Okay. What we do with this and how we can calculate now A and B based on that, we will see next time. Um, for now, we we um, we stop. And I would like to remind you that on Thursday we will not have the lecture because I have I have too many times anyway. Um, so on Thursday we cancel the lecture and we will see each other again next week. Okay, so with this, I would like to thank you for today. And of course, uh, if there's any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Professor, yeah, can you please repeat this, uh, this last, um, the last thing about um, why, why um, uh, Omega Z is, uh, is constant? Um, where do we have it? Well, if you if you look at this here, um, let me just copy it. So omega z, uh, um, the definition of omega z. Wait a second. Um, where do I have it? It's here. Uh, it's 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 one over r uh, d dr of uh, a plus uh, b r squared, right? So um, what, what do we have? Um, we have one over R D, D A D R, right? Plus um, one over R D D R of B R squared. I mean, assume that A and B are constants, which, um, which they are because they, 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 they are the integration constants that come. And obviously the first one is zero and this one will become, what, what is it, two B, right? So that means omega z in any case is, is just two b, whatever b is, and the, the value of a doesn't 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 matter. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Good. But then um, we close for today, and uh, I will upload the videos, and uh, we will not see each other on Thursday, but we will see each other next week. Okay. Thanks a lot for today, and have a good end of the week.